Hi everyone, I'm just getting everything set up um, and we've got a few minutes before we're going to start so just going to make sure the microphone and everything's working. If you can either put a message or uh, do something into the box, let me know that it's working okay, you can hear everything. That will be fab. Fabulous, thank you. All good. All right, well, we're due to start at half past, so I am um, going to just sit here for a few minutes and give everybody time to join. Okay, okay, we just give people a couple more minutes as it gets closer to half past and then we'll kick off. So you've got time to grab a drink if you need to. Get yourself comfy. And then please do ask questions, pop any messages in the in the chat box as we go through. I'll try my hardest to get through them all and to answer them. Ah, oh, great. Glad you're here, Jade, and you're excited. Hopefully I can answer everything that you have. I'm sure you have a list of questions you want to run through. Okay, we'll just wait one more minute um, for anyone else who's joining, and then we'll we'll kick off. So if anyone who's joining now, I'd love to hear from you in the in the chat, in the message bit at the bottom, especially if you're getting ready for weaning, if you've already started weaning, let me know where you're at, what your how old your baby is and what your kind of questions are, if you've got them any as we go through, and I'll make sure to try and answer them. We'll just give it a little bit longer and then we will get started. Oh, hi Josie, you have a five month old little girl, it's exciting, so getting really close to starting weaning. Perfect. All right. Well, we're just coming up for half past. So I think we will crack on. Um, thank you so much for joining. Oh, hello from Norway. Hi over in Norway. Thanks for joining us. Um, so thank you for joining the session. This is all about preparing for weaning. Um, I'm My name's Katie. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. And I'm really excited to do this session with you. I'm really hoping that I'll be able to answer all of your questions. Um, and yeah, have a really nice chat about weaning and getting ready so that you can feel confident and excited when it comes to actually starting to introduce food. So a little bit about me, so you know who I am. Well, I am a registered nutritionist 
I specialize in nutrition from from pregnancy all the way through to toddlerhood but weaning is the area that I am I'm most passionate about that I really enjoy. I have a four year coming a toddler coming up for four years myself um, and I've worked with families and children in the NHS and in private practice uh, for well over 10 years, as well as working alongside the some baby food companies as well. So weaning is really my area and I absolutely love it. But what interests me and, and excites me most about weaning is that it goes beyond the food itself. So what we introduce and how we introduce it is one aspect, but I love the fact that actually when it comes to introducing foods to babies, it's such a bigger picture than that. It's it, it encompasses the whole family and how you feel about food, how how the family eats, and it's such a such an important part of our of our lives. Eating, um, and I really enjoy how we think about introducing foods, not just for offering that particular food, but how it can be the start of how our children develop a relationship with food how we want them to develop a positive relationship with food and how that can have a bigger impact then on, on how they feel about themselves and about their bodies and the whole, whole wide spectrum that, that comes with that. So we are going to talk a little bit about those things as well. Um, what it's not going to be necessarily is uh, this is what you do on what day. Here's a list of foods that you need to give in a particular order because everybody's very, very different. But what you can expect is that we're going to touch on how you can get the right support network in place when it comes to um, introducing food and and weaning. How you might want to think about identifying identifying your own beliefs around food and and how you identify with food and the impact that that can have when it comes to weaning and offering foods to your baby. We're also going to think a little bit about the end goal of feed, feeding babies. Why are we doing this? Why is this such a such a big milestone moment for us? And what do we want to get to um, at the end of it? We will, of course, touch on first foods, thinking about does it matter what you start with, how you start, when you start and the type of food so that you feel comfortable with knowing how to make that choice and, and with the choice that you do end up making. We'll touch on allergens a little bit as well. We will also touch on on milk and the role that that plays for our babies um, during the weaning period and some of the common problems that you may come across. Weaning is a huge topic and I can see there are loads of questions coming through as well. Um, So I'm going to do my best to, to get through as many of them as I possibly can. We have about 45 minutes, so we'll see how we get on. I don't think it's possible to cover absolutely everything to do with weaning in such a short time. Um, But you can always um, have a look on my Instagram or the early years pack that uh, is available through the Positive Birth Company. I have a whole module on there, which takes you through step by step, lots of different stages of weaning and lots of short videos that you can watch. So we'll share the details of that at the end as well. So there's always more support after this after this live session. I'm just having a scan through some of the questions. Um, thank you so much for adding them. So some of the things that I'm seeing here, yes, we're absolutely going to be talking about things that we're struggling with, eating more than one or two spoons, thinking about introducing food and what age, absolutely, feeling nervous about weaning. Oh, bless you. I'm sure we can we can hopefully have you feel a bit more reassured about that. Um, love weaned a lot of animals. That's really interesting. It'd be interesting to see the comparison, I'm sure. Um, and yeah, hopefully that if you do feel worried about how you're doing and, and whether you're doing a good enough job, I hope I can reassure you by the end of it that you absolutely are. Um, I see a lot of parents one to one and and the main thing I hope they come away with is that reassurance that absolutely you're doing a perfectly good job. You can't ruin your baby's feeding experience at all during the weaning process. It's all learning and we all do differently every day and you are doing a good job. So that really, I think, taps into this first point that I wanted to to talk you through, which was around building your support network. And it might be something that you've done when you were pregnant and thinking about what do I want my support network around birth to be like? And perhaps Positive Birth Company was a part of that. And we maybe forget about that then whilst baby's born because we have that ready-made support network. We've found our group, we've been to the classes, we've made our friends, we go to the baby sessions and we maybe don't think about a support network when it comes to feeding but it is important because we you might find that your your groups start to 
start to separate out a little bit or you start to see differences in how people approach food and how people approach weaning in particular you might have people who are really excited about it and some who are really nervous and then that can be quite hard to offer support or relate to each other you might have people who really want to go down a baby led weaning route and others feeling unsure about that and more comfortable with with pureed foods so that can again cause a bit of a divide and you might not have the same support from those people that have been so supportive for for the earlier stage so it's a good idea to have a think about how you might want to introduce food and just suss out is there some other support that I might need if I'm thinking about food safety and cooking and I'm not so confident with that do I need to start to suss out some classes or some Instagram accounts or some friends or family who could perhaps teach me about this or perhaps I need to start to look at some places that might offer a, a food safety course or something to support me around baby first aid and any worries that I have about gagging or choking. As with, with pregnancy and birth and everything, it's always good to try and find these people and these groups and access this before you need it. So if your baby is around four to six months, having a look where's my nearest baby first aid class that I can get to? Um, do I know the foods that I want to introduce? Can I cook them? Can I access them? What am I going to do um, about that? And it's especially true if perhaps you're choosing to, to parent and to have a baby and to, and to wean a baby and to feed a baby in a way that is different to your, your current support network, your family, your friends. You might want to have these conversations with other people and try and, and, try and find people who are on the same page as you. So it's a good idea to just start to look online, start to look at other people who are doing different things and identify those areas where, do you know what, I need a bit of extra support. I just want to, to tap into those people so that you've got those resources when you need them before you kind of come to the, to the crunch point. And building on from that, it might be a nice idea to think about, well, how do you feel about giving your baby food? We kind of know this milestone's coming. We know they need to have food at some point. But if you stop and pause and think about it, and you think about the idea of offering food to your baby and them starting to eat, how do you actually feel about it? What does it kind of bring up for you? And for some people, and I'm seeing in the comments, it might be a really, really anxious feeling and you might feel really unsure and really nervous about it. And you might find yourself getting really worked up or really preoccupied with looking at exactly what foods and textures because there's this underlying anxiety. And if you can pause and just try and take a moment to, to figure out where does that come from? Why am I feeling nervous about it? Is it that I have seen a, a negative experience around food? Is it that I'm, I'm worrying in general about what people will think? or how I offer the food, if it's going to be done in the right way? Do I have an idea from what I've seen online that it has to be done in this perfect way? And that's making me feel nervous that I can't do that. It's trying to understand where that feeling comes from so that you know how to, how to address it and what extra support or um, extra information that you might need. Something that often comes up that I talk to parents about when you stop and think about introducing food to a baby is that it might bring up lots of memories for you about how you were fed as a child. And that can be both positive and negative. And that overriding feeling that you have about food and how you experience food as a child can then come up and raise its head at the table when you're feeling, feeding baby. So just having a step back to acknowledge maybe if you had a negative experience with food as a child, what that was like, what you might want to do differently with your baby, what you need to, to change or what you need to have in your, in your setup at home in order to feed in that way. And having also a conversation with whoever else might be at home who's involved with feeding with you, um, be that a partner, a family member, a friend, whoever else may be in the house on a regular basis also feeding the baby. What was their experience like as a child? What do they feel about food and is it the same as you and are you going to clash on it or are you going to come together to support each other and think in the same way? And if we don't stop and think about it, what I notice with parents that I work with is it can just suddenly come out of nowhere and take you by surprise and there'll be this flood of a feeling or a memory that can hit you at the table when you're trying to feed your baby a particular food that suddenly floors you and, and, and really 
overwhelms you in that moment. So taking the time ahead of then to just have a think about, you know, what was my experience like as a child? Do I enjoy food? Do I still feel, and I speak to adults who, who feel this all the time, but do I still feel anxious at the table around my mum? Or do I still feel anxious at the table around friends? Because I have this underlying feeling about food or something that I didn't enjoy. And the reverse is there as well. We could have such positive memories about food as a, as a child, such wonderful positive family memories about Christmas is often one or Sunday lunches or picnics or being on the beach or just different things that we experience that we really, really want our children to have as well. And that's a really positive thing to hold on to and to want to try and emulate and to try and think about, well, what was it? that made that moment as positive as it was and what gave me that positive memory around food that I can try and uh, bring to life for my baby as well. And all of those things are things that we might not necessarily think about when we're looking at that kind of first steps weaning chart. But I find that if you don't think about them in advance, then they can just come out of nowhere when you're trying to feed some carrot. Um, and it's a really great idea to have a chat with with the other person that you might have at home if there is someone there, because you can often have real, real uh, differences in how you experience food as a child. As well as how you feel, this is also a good time to just think about, well, are we going to feed our baby in a particular way? Do we follow a certain diet that we might need to just consider at this point? And do we agree on it? whoever's involved in feeding baby. So for example, if you are planning, if you're vegan and you're planning to raise your baby as vegan, does everybody involved with feeding understand what that means? Have we thought about it? Do we need to do anything different? Do we need to think about anything or communicate with, with grandparents or childcare providers or, or someone else who's involved with feeding baby? what exactly our intentions are and why that might be and whether we have any flexibility in certain areas or not. And just having a think about it now so that you know and that you feel comfortable um, and that you feel confident in being able to say to that person, this is how I'm feeding my baby. They may agree or disagree, but this is how we're doing it. And that's that's what we want to communicate. What I do find also is that when you start to feed your baby, it can bring up any any concerns or issues you have currently as an adult and you, with your own relationship around food, if you've had any eating disorder or disordered eating in the past, or if you have any kind of worries about your your health, your body image, your weight, or how you eat, if you're, you're a fussy eater as an adult, all of these things can have an influence on how you choose to feed your child. And rather than ignoring them, I think it's a good idea to, to acknowledge them, recognize them, if you need to get support for things now, then it's a good idea to try and try and access that support. And maybe maybe introducing food to your baby is the, the kind of push point that, that gets you into getting any extra support around food that you might need. But recognizing that, you know, this is a big stage for, for babies um, and it's a big stage for us as parents as well. And that is absolutely fine. And there is that extra support out there if we if we need it. So what's the end goal with weaning? Well, a number of things. One, we want to move away from milk, right? We start off by breastfeeding or bottle feeding babies. They're solely on milk. So we know that introducing food marks the start of the end of the milk period. It's about them getting good nutrition and starting to grow and develop out of a baby in towards becoming a toddler. But beyond those two basic things, what is your end goal when it comes to feeding your baby? And it's stepping back and thinking bigger picture. We want them to maybe eat and enjoy meals as a family. We want maybe them to be able to be adventurous with food because we like to travel and we want to go to lots of different places. And we want to know that they can eat a variety of foods that's available to them. We might really want them to be able to um, eat with friends and enjoy meals out at restaurants, but also enjoy meals at other people's houses. You know, perhaps you remember as a child that friend that came round that wouldn't eat anything at your house and would only come like with pre-prepared food or only ate. My brother had a friend that only ate fish fingers and ketchup, that kind of thing. So maybe we, in our heads, we don't want that for our child. We want to think I could send them off to someone's house and they'll eat a variety of foods. Um, we might want them to grow up feeling really positive about food and not having to think about it and just make any choices that they want and enjoy food and not feel like they have to restrict it. 
it's it's keeping these things in mind when it comes to feeding because it's not necessarily about the what that we feed it's more about how we feed and the and the feeling around eating and the feeling that we create and help create for our babies when it comes to to introducing food so that's the kind of overarching bigger picture stuff the stuff that feels really big when it comes to weaning and and we might not often talk about it much but when I see parents with their babies certainly if they're experiencing challenges in the later stages of weaning and in toddlerhood these are the overarching issues that kind of sit behind why some of these issues might occur around fussy eating and difficulties at the table it's all of the feeling stuff that goes goes alongside it it's not the what it it's the how so if we can start to think about it before we introduce food we're a bit prepared for for what it might have what impact it might have and we can start to start to address it but what foods can we start with then so we'll talk about how to how to think about those initial first foods we're just going to keep track of the time as well um because as you can tell i can talk about this for ages so does it matter what we start with yes and no um it doesn't matter broadly what you start with, what food you start with when it comes to weaning your baby in the sense that that one first food you introduce at the start is not going to decide, it's not going to make or break how they eat as a toddler or an adult. You can't feed them broccoli for their first meal and guarantee they're going to be a perfect eater as a toddler, that adventurous eater as a child, that you know brilliant chef as an adult. It doesn't work like that. It's not that straightforward so it doesn't matter whether you choose broccoli or you choose apple or you choose carrot or you choose a potato or a chip or anything particularly for those first couple of foods you know if your baby is the kind of baby that just reaches out and grabs something and you happen to be holding a cake and that's what they have as their very very first taste you haven't failed, you haven't broken your baby, you haven't messed up their relationship with food for good, they're not going to be addicted to cake forever, it just doesn't work like that. What we see being more important is the the wider variety of foods that they have on a regular basis that they are exposed to and they experience on a regular basis. So Yes, you can start to introduce vegetables as the first foods because they might take a little bit more practice and they might take a few more tries for your baby to actually seem to like and enjoy them. Bitter tastes are much harder to get used to than sweet tastes. Sweet tastes are more palatable, so they're more likely to be accepted more uh, a little quickly, a little more quickly than some bitter tastes. So the bitter tastes are the ones that then take practice. And that's why you might see um, information, information suggesting if you introduce these earlier, it will help your baby learn to like them. It's just that they need a bit more practice. They need a, a few more tries at having these foods. And babies at six months-ish are way more amenable to new tastes than toddlers. Toddlers have their own things going on that mean it's a little bit more challenging to offer new foods. Babies at six months are relatively open to a whole array of flavours because they don't know any different. They don't have any experience. It's all new to them. So the kind of idea is if you have those harder te- harder tastes to learn earlier on, your baby might be able to um, accept them more readily. It doesn't mean that they're not going to be a fussy eater when they turn two. It doesn't, it doesn't quite work like that. But it means that those are, are, are nice foods to try and start with. Having said that, you can still offer things like fruit and the sweeter vegetables at the start. You can offer protein foods like lentils and chicken and meat and eggs and fish. You can offer dairy foods like milk and cheese and any kind of carbohydrates like rice and potatoes and pasta and porridge and all of those foods are all absolutely fine at the start of weaning as well. We know that it's important to introduce iron from through foods from six months. So maybe you want to start with iron rich foods because iron feels like an important thing to you particularly if you were uh, struggling with iron during pregnancy, you might have a heightened awareness to it. And so you want to start with iron rich foods. Absolutely fine. Um, You might be more mindful and aware of allergens because that's something that's happened in your family in the past or you just have a, a general interest in that area. So you might want to start with some of the allergenic foods. Absolutely fine as well. It also depends on, you know, what you're doing on the day, where you are, just how life has panned out on that day. 
you might have the best intention in the world and think I'm going to start with broccoli because I think it's going to really help and that's great if that's a food that you eat on a regular basis and you enjoy broccoli and you you know you want your child to eat it because it is a regular part of your diet anyway and then it just so happens that you're sick on that day or you, your baby's sick on that day and it doesn't end up happening and you end up having a small amount of porridge or or they end up licking something off your spoon both are absolutely fine. There is no absolutely right or wrong answer when it comes to the the first food that you should start with. The important thing is not to stress about it. Your baby won't be a perfect eater if you follow the kind of 14 day plan, you know, or if you just kind of go completely free, free as a bird, whatever you're having on that particular day, both are fine. It very much depends on your your personal preference, your style, whether you're a planner, whether you like to follow a plan or whether you're much more free with it. It really doesn't matter. Um, so that's that's one thing not to not to stress about in terms of whether you start with uh, finger foods or purees. Again, it really depends on how comfortable you feel um, and and whether you feel anxious about offering finger foods versus versus pureed foods because that anxiety might make the experience more challenging if you feel really really worried about the finger foods and if offering purees for a little a little while the first few days helps you get into the swing of it and feel much calmer and enjoy the mealtime yourself then that's fine you know that that helps you feel calm around mealtimes you might then be more likely to introduce finger foods after that what we do know is is uh, is important is that babies do need to experience texture in order to develop the skills to eat because eating is a skill and they need to learn it. It doesn't just appear and it doesn't just happen because they hit a certain age. So they can only learn to chew and they can only learn to self-feed themselves if we give them the opportunity. So we have to offer them textured foods and we have to offer them finger foods and spoons and forks in order for them to learn. But like with any skill, this can happen at different times for different babies. So there's no right or wrong and there's no complete cut off of you must introduce finger foods by eight months or they won't be able to feed themselves. It doesn't happen like that. Babies don't have this internal clock that suddenly switches at any point. So it's more feeling, you know, do you feel comfortable doing it? Do you know how to prepare finger foods safely so that they're they're not likely to choke on them? And then can you start to offer them in a way that feels relaxed for the baby, that doesn't put any pressure on them, that kind of goes, hey, they're here. If you want to try them, great. I'm not going to pressure you. Here's the different options that you've got. And allowing them the opportunity to, to reach out, grab things when they're ready when they see you do it, when they feel calm, they're much more likely to, to get involved and to start to feed themselves. But if you need to introduce purees at the start to help you feel comfortable in doing that, as well as going to a, a baby first aid class, then that's absolutely fine to do. Um, and you might see the same when you think about uh, whether you prepare food yourself from scratch or whether you use any manufactured baby foods or get someone else to cook it for you. You know, it's all about finding that balance of, of easing into it in a way that helps you feel safe secure calm relaxed around food because babies as you know pick up on your feelings and if you're super anxious about the texture or what the food is then then they're going to pick up on that and they're not going to eat as a, as a result of it um, I'm just going to have a quick scan through the questions because there's a few more coming through and I want to make sure that I've covered the, all the ones that people asked when it comes to starting um a couple more we're going to come on to in a second. Um, da, 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 thinking about earlier than six months or waiting till six months. And then in terms of allergens as well. So let's chat a little bit about that because, yes, there has been some articles about the kind of age of introducing and, and how allergens weigh into that. So, again, it's not click up because babies... As we know, we all, or well, many of us on the on the um, watching the video, have birthed a baby. They don't follow a calendar. They don't follow a schedule. And the same is true when it comes to weaning. You know, we can't expect them to suddenly get to six months and and something switches inside to say, "I'm ready for food. It's going to be digested well. I'm going to accept it, and it will be smooth sailing from here." Unfortunately, we can't see what's going on inside babies, so we don't know 
when their digestive system is fully ready. What we do know is that different stages of the digestive system develop at different times. So the, the digestive enzymes that start in your mouth, for example, in your saliva that digest certain types of foods might appear earlier than, than some of the ones in your, in, your, um, in your guts, in your intestines. Different babies will, you know, as they will develop teeth at different rates and they learn to sit up at different rates, all of this internal digestion changes happen at different rates as well. And it's just impossible for us to know. So what we have to go on is what they show us externally through their through their um, the visible cues that we've got in order to decide, are they developmentally ready for food? And when we think about developmentally ready, we're thinking, is it going to be safe for them to hold this food, to eat this food without choking, without causing harm? And what we know is that roughly the internal development matches this external visible development somewhere between four to six months. But we can't know for sure for every baby exactly what the day that's going to be. What we can assume is that more babies are going to definitely be ready when it gets to six months and fewer are definitely ready closer to four months. And so from a general advice perspective, we have to err on the side of caution and say, around six months, most babies are going to be fine to have food, so offer it. And that includes allergens as well. What the, the kind of recent discussion has been around is how can we try and prevent allergies from happening? Is there a best way to introduce food that allows us to prevent allergies from happening? Because understandably, we don't want our babies or, or children or us as adults to be allergic to foods if we can avoid it. And we know that given that we used to um, encourage pregnant women to avoid peanuts, that actually now has flipped on its head and we encourage people to have peanuts during pregnancy. So we know that this area is, is ever changing when it comes to advice. And there's been a few studies in a recent year, in the recent years that have looked at if I introduce certain foods at certain times between four and six months, can it help prevent babies becoming allergic? And there's a small amount of evidence to suggest that possibly that is true for a small group of people who are already highly likely to become allergic. If we introduce a couple of allergens, um, specifically peanut, peanut and hen's egg, um, prior to six months, then we might help them reduce their risk of allergy. But it's very much those two allergens, peanut and hen's egg, in babies that are already identified as being highly likely to be allergic to something in that particular short window in a certain order and in specific quantities. So it's really niche um, and, and the kind of discussion of it in the wider media can be challenging because it doesn't apply to everybody. So it doesn't mean that everybody should start introducing food between four and six months. But if you have a baby that is already at risk of an allergy because, um, because they perhaps have already been diagnosed with cow's milk allergy or they have um, a diagnosis of eczema already, then they're highly, uh, they are more likely to be allergic to certain foods. So if that is your baby, have a chat with your GP and health visitor. Um, I can share some resources after in the link uh, for the for the study website where it gives you some kind of guidance on that. But it's very much that specific group of babies who are already at risk. For everybody else, for the general population, there's no real benefit to introducing it early. As far as we know right now, and I can only speak for the science as of today, and we know that it changes on a um, not on a regular basis, but it does change as we find out more. But for now, most babies will need to have food somewhere around six months, it might be a bit before, it might be a bit after, whatever your interpretation of around six months is. Um, but for those babies who are at that higher risk of allergy, have a chat to your healthcare professional about that, that advice and they can help guide you because even then, it very much depends on that individual baby and how severely allergic they are to cow's milk you know how the severity of their eczema so even even with those babies it's not as straightforward as saying you know well then go ahead and introduce these foods straight away we might need to put together a really specific plan for that baby so always go and have a chat to to the health professional if that if that is your baby for any other allergens if your baby is has not been identified as being um, at risk 
Then from six months, you can safely introduce the allergens one at a time as you would any other food. So the allergens being things that contain wheat and gluten, um, nuts and peanuts, um, cow's milk on its own, eggs, fish, shellfish, um, soya is another one, sesame. These things you want to introduce just as you would any other food on their own for the first time. So you don't mix the two allergens together. So for example, um, omelette with cheese, you wouldn't offer together to start with. You could offer the cheese on its own so that you know they're fine with dairy. And then the egg separate or um, peanut butter on toast is another example. Offer the peanut butter separately, offer the toast separately, and then you know that they're fine with peanuts and they're fine with gluten. Um, but once you've introduced them once or twice and you've seen that the baby is absolutely fine with them, have them as part of the normal diet. Um, what we do know is that if you delay introducing allergens, then it can increase the likelihood that your baby becomes allergic. So it's important to not wait until your baby's much older, i.e. over one year of age, before you start introducing the allergens. Get them in in that six to 12 month window when they're having all their other tastes and textures um, and just have them as a, as a regular part there. Think about whether you do actually eat the food. So for example, technically nuts, each kind of nut is a different allergen, but unless you eat all the different kinds of nuts on a regular basis, it's not hugely realistic to expect you to introduce each single nut type that we have uh, one at a time. So think about the things that you are most likely to come across and that you are most likely to have as part of your diet on a regular basis and, and introduce those. And then also, you know, if you're planning to, to raise your baby as vegan, have a think about whether you do want to introduce those foods or not, because if you're not going to eat them on a regular basis, then perhaps it's not so important to you that um, they get introduced to fish, for example. Uh, but if you're ever not sure, I will pop a link with the when we finished at the end. Um, and uh, Allergy UK is a really great resource to, to have a look at. They have a fantastic guide and, and loads more information. And then I think we also had a video in the in the early years pack as well. But I'm conscious of time and I'm going to digress and just start chatting here about allergens for ages. So one thing I wanted to, to add on to um, thinking about those, those first foods is what you do after those first couple of days. We, we have so much talk about the, the starting point. What day do I start? How do I start? What does that first meal or week look like? And there's such a tiny window in the grand scheme of things, in the grand scheme of their weaning, but in life in general, it's such a tiny window to have so much emphasis on. Actually, think about just the kinds of foods you eat on a regular basis. Is this a good time as a family to think about the way that you eat, what you eat, how you eat, the setup that you have when it comes to meal times and cooking and, and all of that, because that's the more important thing. That's how babies will, will learn to eat, is by watching you and by being a part of the meal time. So that first week, if you're preparing things specifically for them, is great, but it's not going to have that, that bigger effect on, on how they eat as they get older. So perhaps think about, well, maybe we as a family want to find a way to introduce oily fish more in our diet because I want my baby to offer it to have it and learn to like it but actually as an adult I don't really know if I do like it and we don't eat it that often so maybe now's the time to bring some salmon in or learn to like sardines or mackerel or whatever it might be you know think about your diet your way of eating and do you want your baby to be able to to emulate that and if not maybe think about any changes that you might want to to make. We're going to touch on milk um, because milk remains important throughout the whole weaning process. The goal of introducing food is not to get rid of milk by the time your baby turns one. Milk very much does, does the hard work, does the legwork. Milk is providing the bulk of the nutrition, the bulk of the energy for your baby throughout that entire first year of life. Weaning is about complementary feeding it's about adding foods to complement the milk the food is there to help your baby learn to eat to teach the skills to introduce textures to allow them to experience tastes um, but it's not there to replace milk in terms of providing the vast majority of your baby's nutrition so whether that's formula milk or breast milk or both together 
they still are the most important thing when it comes to to nutrition. Um, And that's really important to remember if you find that in these early weeks, your baby's just not that interested in food. And we'll talk about the, the kind of common challenges, that being one of them. But if that is the case, milk is still the most important thing. It doesn't matter if your baby's not eating a lot of food because milk is doing the vast majority of the work for us. And that's how we need it to be. It's more energy dense. It's more nutrient dense than the foods that we will be offering our babies whilst we're weaning. So milk remains important. As you get closer to 12 months, you will see a shift from your baby. And ideally, we want it to be led by them. We want to follow their lead as much as possible when it comes to um, reducing milk and making that switch from milk as the dominant factor to food as the dominant factor. But it, it will be around 9, 10, 11 months sometimes even closer to 12 months, but it's that latter part of weaning. The first part is very much milk, 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 nice little bit of food if you um, if you want it. When we are thinking about milk, we are keeping everything the same as it has been around six months, you know, the same kind of milk. You don't need to change the milk to a different kind if you're formula feeding. You don't need to swap it to cow's milk or anything like that. It's the same milk. It's the same way of feeding until um until we reach 12 months of age what might change is your baby might start to seem like they prefer food towards that nine or ten months and then you might think okay let's take away some of the milk feeds perhaps offering the same number but a smaller volume or perhaps thinking about how does the structure of meals and snacks and milk look in the day and taking away some of the milk feeds Ideally led by your baby, but I realise sometimes that's easier said than done um, and you don't always get the, the cues from your baby when to introduce milk, but uh, when to decrease milk, sorry. But ideally led by your baby, if they seem to be really, really interested in food at um, at breakfast time, for example, or in that early morning, then that might be the one to swap around from having milk to, to focusing more on food. It might be that in the evening time, they actually still really just want milk and milk is their main focus. And that's absolutely fine. They might not be interested in food at that point. So you'll notice a pattern with your baby where they're more open and amenable to food and where they really just want to focus on milk because then it's about getting that um, that feed in and, and getting that milk in. Something else that you can think about when it comes to to dropping feeds is perhaps changing the order of milk and food. So in the early part of weaning, you might want to offer milk to begin with and then a tiny bit of food at the end because then they're not too starving hungry and they're maybe a little bit happy and, and open to the idea of food. And then you might find that you want to switch that round because they just are really more focused on the food. So then you make the food the star of the show and offer the milk after. Something else to consider might be then that they perhaps need to take milk um, away from the idea of it being their main meal, having milk in the bedroom or perhaps having a room that you feed milk in versus having food, which happens at the table. And this maybe applies more if you're bottle feeding, but you know, having that separation between, hey, this is mealtime, this is where we have food. When we have milk, it's something we have in the morning, maybe in our room when we're waking up or or just before we go to bed or whatever your, your routine looks like. And it's really impossible to say what is the right thing for you and your baby because we, we know that babies feed differently, their routines are different. Alongside introducing food, you've also got them, you know, potentially learning to crawl, more teeth coming through, sleep patterns changing, more growth spurts, illnesses, they might be going to childcare towards the latter stages or or any point. So you've got all of these things happening that also impact whether your baby's interested in food or milk. If they're ill, they're going to want milk more than food because it's easier, it's comforting, it feels more nourishing because it's connected to you, whereas food is that little bit of independence and step away and it can be difficult. So each day might look different when it comes to milk and that is absolutely fine too. You notice it even as they become toddlers, some days they just want more milk and they want to focus on something that's a little bit easier to to eat and digest just noticed a question um my tamathol doesn't eat a lot but then we'll drink eight ounces straight after a meal it's like she only wants the milk and isn't interested in food do i follow her lead yeah 
absolutely. It depends. I would say have a look overall the day. So have a think about the day as a whole. Does that happen with every meal? Does it happen with some meals more than others? Do you notice a pattern? Um, and do you notice a pattern when it comes to the different kinds of foods that she's being offered or the way that they're being offered food, um, whether it's a, you know, a, a more finger food meal or whether it's a spoon fed led by you meal? Have a look at the different pattern if you see it. Again, think about, is there anything else going on? Is she having a really big growth spurt? And actually, she needs both food and milk. Um, and then have a think about that kind of separating it out. So food is food and then milk is separate. Even at 10 months, you know, you can start to say that to your baby and, and to talk to them about, you know, we're having food now for dinner. You're going to have milk then at bedtime, just before bed, whatever the pattern is. Yeah, lots of teeth coming through has a huge difference. I have a wisdom tooth coming through. And oh, my goodness, the pain when it does happen. I can't imagine what that's like for babies to have that amount of pain. If they've got two or three teeth coming through at any one go, of course, they don't want to eat. Of course, they want to have milk instead. It's the, the, the biggest challenge is that we just don't know a lot of the time. And you kind of have to just cycle through these things that it could be. And then probably by the time you cycled through, it's a week later and then and then things have moved on because that's just how babies work, right? By the time you've figured it out, we're on to the next thing. Someone else asked a question, how many meals should we start with? When does it change, increase? It's another one I don't have a great answer for. It really depends. So to start with, maybe once, maybe twice. I would say it depends when are they napping? When are they with you? When do you eat? So we want babies to learn by copying us. If you only ever have your meal times while they're sleeping, and I wouldn't blame you if that was the case, but if you only have your food while they're sleeping, they're probably gonna struggle to start with because they've not really experienced you eating, so they won't know. So then I would say, pick a meal time that you wanna eat that they can be involved in and start at that one meal time so they can, they can connect to you there. If you happen to always have breakfast when they're up and about and they see you having that and then you have lunch when you're out maybe or you're visiting someone and they're also awake for it, then they might want to try food at both of those meal occasions. And that's absolutely fine. What I would change in your mind is that it's not a meal for babies. What we're having is occasions to try food and experience food, mealtime occasions, food occasions, opportunities to eat rather than meal. And I think that little reframe can help us when we think about other challenges, as in how much food is my baby eating? When do I know this meal is over? Have they eaten enough food? Is this the right food? If you take away meals, then you take away that idea that we have that we need to have three meals a day and they need to provide certain amounts of nutrition and food. And actually, for babies in the early days, it's about what opportunities can I give them to explore food safely, to explore different textures, to explore different tastes, and to experience food in the environment that feels calm, relaxed, happy to both of us. And then it doesn't really matter, right? It doesn't matter how many times a day that that happens. It might be twice, it might be once, it might be three times. It's absolutely fine. Follow your baby with that. It leads me into this last bit. Oh, Tyler, I'm sorry, I'm going to run over this. 45 minutes is up, but we, we have lots to chat about. So I'm going to keep going for a little bit longer um, whilst my dinner's being cooked downstairs. We're going to touch on some challenges that you might hear for the last 10 minutes. So the, the challenges that are kind of most common and that I'm seeing in the comments as well um, in terms of showing an interest in food, um, in terms of not really... Um, wanting to try food or not wanting to have food there themselves um what else is here positive relationship with food worrying about choking and gagging absolutely so not being interested in food at the early stages is really normal Social media might have you believe that you're going to present a bowl full of pureed food to your baby and they're going to eat the whole bowl. And then that's the start of this wonderful weaning journey where they do the same every day and you check it off on a checklist and tick, tick, tick. They've had all these foods. You make a lovely bowl of porridge and you put your little seeds and your berries and everything on top and they just sit and eat it. And sometimes it happens, but more often than not, it doesn't. More often than not, it's a couple of licks of a spoon. OK, I'm done or it's uh, moving a bit of food around their mouth before spitting it back out again. 
and that's the second occasion they have food. That all counts. That is all getting used to food. That is all experiencing food. That is weaning. Um, Weaning is not eating a full bowl of porridge. It's those little exposures to food. And that might be that your baby then only has those kinds of experiences for the first couple of months. They're still becoming used to food. They're still learning. They're still learning tastes. They're still watching you eat. They're still getting familiar with food. And that's absolutely fine if they only have one one mouthful, say, and then they're genuinely hungry, so they need to have some milk. The risk we have if we don't give them those opportunities and we try and force them to eat a bit more is they can really want to push back on that or if they are genuinely really hungry then they can get very upset because actually they just want milk they just want to be satisfied by milk they know what to do it's going to help fill that that hunger gap and we don't want them to then have a, a develop a negative experience with with the spoon with the high chair which is another common uh, concern that i see is babies being then reluctant to go in the high chair or very unsure about sitting at the table or being unsure about being presented with the spoon and often it might come from the fact that we are so um so keen to try and get them to to eat food that we perhaps persevere past the point that we should we perhaps keep going when perhaps we should back off a little bit and just let that that moment sit there and and continue milk feeding I don't often come across parents that are force feeding their children, but pressure doesn't always mean force feeding. Pressure can come in being overly positive and overly praising and and kind of doing the aeroplane spoon thing to really encourage your child and to say, you know, oh, look how yummy this green bean is. I really love it. It's so tasty. You should try it. It sounds positive, but it is a form of pressure as well. And even with small babies, they can kind of feel that. And you know this from when you're trying to get a baby to do anything else. If they don't want to do it, they really push back on it and you can't make them. And the same is true with food. So it's about thinking, well, look, I'm going to read their signs. They're telling me they're not interested right now. That's fine. Let's keep it relaxed. We'll just stop for this time being. Let's give them milk right now and then we'll try again later and we'll try again tomorrow. And for some babies, that might take a good couple of months. It might take two, three months, and that is absolutely fine and normal. What I would be thinking about is, are they seeing you eat? Are they seeing other people eat? Do they get the opportunity to explore food in other ways? Are they able to explore um, textures and touch and and get some sensory play? So we know that at least they are having this this experience of, of soft foods, of slimy foods, of hard foods, of rough foods. So they get used to the idea that things feel different ways. Are they able to have some kind of food play as well? That means there is zero pressure to eat. But if they do have the taste of something in their mouth, then great, they're they're getting that exposure there. So things like yogurt can be great for food play. We're not presenting it on a spoon to eat, but we're maybe putting it on the tray for them to just get their hands in. This is why it's good to think about how you feel about food and mess, because if you are very anxious about mess, weaning may be a particular challenge and it's something to think about because babies are messy babies learn through touch and play and smell and you want your baby to be able to get their hands messy to allow food to be all over their face and in their hair because they're trying to figure it out for themselves right the only way if you went to to a a completely foreign land another planet and you didn't speak the language and you didn't didn't know what what food was safe to eat the only way you would figure it out is one by watching the other people or the other creatures that were there and seeing well what do they eat and then after you've seen what they you might want to go smell it to just be like "Mm, does it feel like it's edible from the smell and then you might want to touch it and you might want to prod it because you want to know what that texture is before you put it in your mouth As an adult who has experienced lots of different foods, you can look at a blueberry for an example and you know what it's going to roughly feel like. You can you know what the texture is going to be like because you've got that experience, whereas a baby doesn't. So to them, they have to press it and they have to poke it and they have to throw it and they have to squash it to figure out what is this thing that you've presented me with. And then they might feel safe enough to put it near their mouth, but they might not want to eat it yet because it still doesn't quite feel right. 
So they might just want to hold it in their mouth or they might just want to lick it or they might just want to chew it for a bit and then spit it out because they're still not sure if it's food and if it's okay. And then they might get around to eating it and enjoying it. And some babies will whistle through that in the space of a few seconds and you won't even notice, whereas others really will go through that whole process from looking and touching all the way through to eventually eating it. And there's no right or wrong with that. And it's and it's something to just watch out for. Maybe your baby is more cautious. Maybe that's just in their nature to be a little bit more cautious or a bit curious or a bit, you know, investigative. And maybe that's a sign of what they're going to be as an adult. They're going to be a detective because they really can explore these things. There's no, there isn't a right or wrong with it. It's It's just observing what your baby does and thinking, well, okay, so I need to offer food slightly differently. I need to give them more time. I need to give them chance to explore away from the table as well. Um, and this is where, you know, baby groups or children's centres and, and places can be so helpful because they can allow you to have that safe food play and safe sensory play outside your home so you don't have to deal with the mess, but perhaps in a way which means, you know, it's more affordable and you don't have to waste food at home because that is that is something to think about too. Um, I feel like I've gone off topic somewhat from, from the question. So we talked about them not being interested and refusing food, um, about staying calm, about thinking about getting them involved in food away from the table. Um, the same is true if they seem only interested in a spoon and only being spoon fed by you and they seem a little reluctant to touch the foods. Again, very normal. Think about how you can help them feel more comfortable in that. And sometimes it can identify sensory issues that they might have. But the first step would be just getting them involved in food, in textures, in food play, in, in any kind of sensory play away from the table. Um, somebody did mention about choking and gagging. I don't really have time to go into it in a lot of detail, but um, contacting an organisation that does a, a baby first aid course is, is a really good first starting point and, and will help you feel a bit comfortable um, with that. And then I think we touched on it in the in the early years pack as well. So there is there is a, a bit more depth on on how to manage it if it was to happen. Um, I mentioned about feeling distressed in the high chair. Focus on the focus on the environment. You know, we, babies have to feel calm and relaxed in order to eat as you do as an adult, it's very hard to eat under pressure. Um, and if you're experiencing a great deal of stress or feeling really anxious about the environment that you're in, the same is true of babies. So if they've had a negative experience in the high chair, that might be one thing. Or what you might think about is, is it in a location that they feel comfortable in? Maybe it's very noisy, maybe it's very bright, maybe it's very cold because it's near the door. Maybe they feel like they're just too far away from the rest of the family. The family's down that end of the table and they're off on their own in their high chair. All of these things can play a role. So have a think about that when you're kind of choosing where you're putting it, that they do feel involved in family meal times. Um, and also that it is genuinely comfortable that, you know, they're not really... Um, slumped to one side in the high chair that they're not really constrained or restricted in any particular way because that can have a big impact on on whether they feel comfortable enough to um to eat and then the last one that i'm gonna touch on very quickly whilst also having a look at everybody's questions and i'm really sorry that i think i've probably missed some as i'm going through um, the last one i wanted to touch on because it is a uh, uh, something that happens and, and i get talking to parents about quite commonly at the start of weaning is constipation. It's everyone favorite, everyone's favourite topic. We've, we've been used to it since we were pregnant. It's just a part of our lives now. Constipation does happen at the start of weaning for quite a lot of babies for a few different reasons. One, it's just a big digestive change for them. You remember when you were pregnant, your digestion's all over the place and it can then have an impact on constipation. For babies, they're having all these different foods their body's only been used to digesting milk up until this point and now it's got to work really hard so to start with you will see not just sweet corn but peas beans chunks of food pass through whole your baby's digestive system has to work really hard to to get used to digesting these foods 
Um, so that's why you, you do often experience constipation at the start. It could be a sign to slow down. It could be a sign that you're introducing too much too quickly. And perhaps you need to, to rein it back and have fewer meals or less food. Um, and sometimes that means, you know, just offering a tiny amount and then giving them milk instead. And just whilst you kind of find that balance for them and their digestive system has time to catch up. It might be, you know, you need to just watch the kind of fiber content of the foods that you're offering babies. We're so used to focusing on fiber as an adult, but for babies, actually, we don't want them to have loads of fiber in one go because their little tiny digestive systems can't quite cope with it. So things like brown rice, brown pasta, brown, re brown bread, fine in small quantities, but not all of it. It's going to overload baby a bit too much. Um, it might be actually that we're not giving them enough healthy fats as well. Babies need fats in their diet, and that can also have a have an effect on their um, on their toileting and on on digestion. So making sure they do have those really good fats like avocados and um, such a millennial answer. Sorry, avocados, salmon, oily fish, um, olive oil spreads milk you know that milk that they're having from you having those healthy fats in there is important to help with constipation as well but also giving them that you know massage warm baths a tiny bit of water alongside meals is also important to help if you notice that it's been a couple of weeks and you're really having some issues with constipation go see um, a gp or um or your health visitor about it and and maybe you know, pull back on the food a little bit so that they're they're not too overwhelmed. Okay, that was a real rattle through those last ones. I'm sorry, I'm rushing. Um, I just want to have a quick look at some of the questions. Uh, da, 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 da. Interested? How do we know that baby is interested in starting food? She'll show you. She'll grab it. She will grab the food. Um, she doesn't necessarily have to sit up by herself. We just want her neck and head to be steady and showing some interest by grabbing the food, by showing that she can. Um, not all babies will sit up on their own when it comes to introducing food because they you know, developmentally may not be able to. Somebody else has their own allergy. They avoid gluten at home because of their allergy. Um, will this negatively impact baby? She won't be exposed. I would look at how you can safely introduce those kinds of things. It often comes up in relation to peanut allergy as well. If a person at home has a peanut allergy, how can we introduce the food safely to baby whilst keeping the other person safe as well? So it might be thinking about, is there another family member that is able to offer those foods at a different location, at a different time? Um, can it be something that can be done by somebody else away from the home? And think about where you might be able to, to fit them in, because if the baby is not allergic to the food, there is absolutely no reason to avoid it for them. Um, allergens we did talk about briefly. Allergy UK is always your go to. Um, Rarely opening the mouth for finger foods after six weeks into weaning. My first step would be thinking about the kind of play options and where they can get their hands involved with food away from the table. Obviously, I would have lots more questions for you in, 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 in person. But to start with, yeah, take away the emphasis on actually eating and instead focus on playing with the food, touching the food, getting involved that way. Um, difference between first infant milk and six months. So follow on milk, six months plus. Um, there's not really any difference between both of them. Some brands you might find a slight difference in nutrition content, but most will be broadly the same. Um, depending on your views, the cynic in you would say that's a marketing thing, but you definitely don't need to change from a first infant milk. Uh, once your baby hits six months, you're absolutely fine to keep on that one. Where, da, 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 choking. I can totally understand that your older child choking would really knock your confidence. Absolutely. If you've already done a first aid course, do one again. You absolutely can't do too many of those. Um, and think about how somebody else could support you with the foods that you feel most concerned about. So, um, yeah, how else can other family members support you with that? And that might be them stepping in to do some of the feeding um, and allowing you that space to kind of work through that and to feel comfort, uh, confident about it again. 
Um, mm, I think I've broadly covered everything. Water, someone asked a question about water. Anything for water, offer it from six months. Tap water is absolutely fine. Absolutely fine. If you offer it from the start, generally, you know, they don't know any different. So most will be, be fine. And then as they get older, if they do seem really reluctant, you can, of course, add small amounts of juice over, over kind of one year of age once you're really into oral hygiene as well. But even adding, you know, chopped up fruit to water or um, you know, like mint leaves, lemon slices to water can, can help children feel more comfortable around drinking. Things like smoothies, things like ice lollies that you make yourself with blended fruit and milk is another great way to get fluid in. Drinks don't, the, the fluid that we need doesn't have to come from a drink. It can also come from the food that we're eating as well. Um, and then I, I think broadly we've covered all of these and I'm sorry if I haven't. I'm going to wrap up because I've been going for an hour and thank you for persevering and sticking with me if you have made it all the way till the end. I have one last thing to share with you before I go. Um, of course, you can find me on Instagram. I am at Katie Angotti Nutrition. Um, and if you have a look on Positive Birth Company, you'll find me linked there. But the early years pack, which we do have a full weaning course there, has lots more videos. You can get 15% off the early years pack until the end of May, until the end of this month, with um, the code early years 15, and that's 1-5. Um, again, I think we'll pop all the details at the bottom, but it's 15% off with that code until the end of the month. And then as a thank you, you do also get 10% off all Positive Birth Company courses until midnight tomorrow. So that's the 26th of May. If you use the code 10, 1, 0, and then weaning. So 1, 0, weaning will get you 10% off all of the all of the courses. But thank you so much to everyone for watching. I'm really sorry if I didn't get to your question properly. I hope I managed to cover off uh as many as possible please do send me a message on instagram if i didn't um come and have a chat over there um and yeah enjoy the rest of your evenings thank you so much all for for watching